Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson one of the multi-platform series of 8086 assembly programming tutorials. The multi-platform series is where we consider a concept and we look at some code that will solve that problem, um, but the code itself doesn't particularly require one system or another. For example, today we're going to be looking at random numbers and range checking, and the code we're looking at today is being tested on the 8086 in MS-DOS, but it should port fine to the Wonderswan, which is also 8086 based, and we'll be uh, using that code in that system later. So today we're looking at the generation of pseudo-random numbers in a predictable fashion, and we're also looking at range checking to check for collisions. And the code you can see here, if I move this cursor to this bat, you, can, you will see the bat will change position. And if I move to it again from a different side, it'll change position again. And so we're checking if the bat is within range of the cursor. And if it is, we're giving it a new random position. Now, this code is the starting point for my suck shoot game, which is a simple little game that I'm porting. It was originally written for the 6809, and I'm now porting it to the 8086. And these are two of the modules that game uses. Now, the random number generator we're looking at today is definitely not the best in the world. It is okay, but it's not amazing. The, the It has two important attributes for my purposes though. Firstly, it's a pseudo random number generator. You give it a 16-bit seed and it will produce the same result from that seed every single time, so it's predictable. The other thing that's important about it is it's the same random number generator that I've used on all of my other systems. It produces the same random numbers from the same seed on the 8086 as it does on the Z80 or the 6502 or the 68000. So if I want to create a game with an infinite number of random levels, Levels, um, I can use this random number generator and the levels will appear the same on all of these systems. That's the hope anyway. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at these simple pieces of code to solve these problems. So let's go over to the source code and let's take a look. Okay, so this is the code we're looking at today. Um, we're looking at this Sukshuk code here. Now this is the starting version of this game. It needs some more work doing to it, but it's a good starting point to test the random number generator and the range checker. Now the random number generator uses two different kinds of random number generation. It was designed for a game called Chibi Aliens, which needed 16-bit random numbers. So it actually uses two different random number generators and the 8-bit random numbers are created as a combination of the two. Now part of the random number generator does use a, um, lookup a pair of lookup tables for random numbers. And you can see those lookup tables just here. It also has a random seed. This is a 16-bit number and this is used as the source of the generation. Now in the code we're going to be looking at today, we don't actually specify a 16-bit seed. We're just using this randomize enemy function here. And if we have a look at that, here it is. Now, this will produce a random number with the do ranged random function, which will require the random number to be within a minimum and maximum range because our game will need the sprites to always appear on the screen. Now, here's this do ranged random function. It's very straightforward. We're calling the function do random, and this do random function automatically increments the 16 bit random seed. So it's a very simple um, low maintenance or no maintenance version of the random number generator. We don't need to worry about providing it a random seed. It always provides an 8 bit number in return, and that is in AL. And we're just comparing to the range. And if it's not a valid number that's been given back to us, we're re randomizing until we've got something we're satisfied with. So that's how this function is being used. Now we're using this do random function here. And the way this works is it's incrementing the 16 bit random seed. It's using do random word and it's basically combining the two together into a single byte. The um, 16 bit random number will be provided in the AX pair, but we're just combining them via an XOR into AL here. So we use this do random word function to get our 16 bit value. And this uses two subparts, one to get the H part and one to get the L part. And these are called do random byte one and do random byte two. And these work quite differently. And the reason for this is that um, I wanted the random number generators to create good random numbers, even if only part of the 16 bit um, seed had changed. So if we're incrementing the low part, I wanted the high part to still change. So that's why we're using two very different methods of random number generator here. Now, the first one is very simple. We're using do random byte one here. And this is basically taking the two parts of the seed, which are provided in CX, CH, and CL, 
and it's basically bit shifting these around with an XORing effect and this is combining these two together in that way. Now this is kind of similar to the one that the ZX Spectrum uses I believe that's quite a, a simple way of doing things but it provides reasonably random numbers at least you know if you just pull something out you, you will not immediately see that there's any particular pattern to them but it's not amazing either. So that's what we're doing for the low byte. The high byte we're doing in a very different way though we're using a lookup table or actually a pair of lookup tables the, the lookup tables I mentioned before here they are so we're using these two lookup tables to provide some more randomness and this is so that the top byte and the bottom byte don't have any noticeable pattern between them you know they, they don't um, they don't look too similar the numbers that are generated by them and so we're loading the pointer to the random table one here and then we're taking the bottom four bits of our H part here and we're using those as a lookup into that table and we're loading a, a byte in from that there now what we're doing then is we're actually using our first random number generator to get a second random seed here and we're then masking that so we get a value from 0 to 15 and we're using that as an offset in the second random table from our lookup table here and then we're XORing those two parts together to get a second random byte and so these are two different ways of sort of generating random numbers one just using shifts and XORs which is a simple way um, it's reasonably effective and then the other one is using lookup tables to get the second random byte and the intention as I say is that the two random bytes that make up the 16-bit pair should change continuously even if the random seed source is only changed by one each time we execute this procedure so there we go so those are the random number generators that I'm using and they are you know adequate for my needs as I say the priorities were that they created random numbers that were predictable and also that the important thing with a random number generator is typically that it will produce given enough time every value within its entire range from so from 0 to 255 or from 0 to 65535 and if they don't this could cause your game to crash say for example you need to um, spawn a new enemy on the screen but all of the possible positions are, except one are already filled by enemies well if your random number generator doesn't eventually come up with that one possible position your game would lock up so uh, that is something that is generally considered important for random number generators and as I say as far as I'm aware my random number generator is is pretty adequate for that purpose so that's the random number generator now the next thing we're going to look at is the range checking and the range checking is being done by this routine range test player here now this works in the following way the what we're going to do is we're going to load the position of the player x and y into ch and l and the enemy x and y into bh and bl so those are our two coordinates and then we're going to specify a width and a height for the range now if we go over to our theater screen we can have a look at this concept maybe so here is the way we're working with our range checking so we we're specifying a point that we want to test so for example this blob here and we're then specifying a height and a width and then we're testing compared to our second point and seeing if that second point is within the range specified by that height and that width so that's what our code is effectively going to do now the tricky thing with this is is that our sprite might be at the very very far side of the screen and so by checking the range we might actually overflow and all of these are going to work in 8-bit values so if we go below zero we would wrap around to 255 which could cause some malfunctioning because if we had one sprite at the far left of the screen and one sprite at the far right here and we did our range check and um, if we are checking and going below 255 we would then wrap around our check to the other side and so without the uh, overflow checking we would actually detect that our sprite on the far side of the screen had collided and so we're going to have to do the range checking to make sure that doesn't happen okay so here's our code and this is the range checker and when this executes we will have bx pointing to one object and cx pointing to the other and the range that we're checking in dx here and the high byte is always the x coordinate or width and the l byte is always the y coordinate or width so we're going to start by processing the x position here we're using the al register as our working um, accumulator here so first of all we're loading the x position of our first position and so we've got our sprite here and what we're doing is we're subtracting the width of the range it's effectively moving our sort of testing position to something like here and then what we're doing then is we're testing to see if we've overflowed because if we have we test it off the screen 
And if that's the case, we're going to skip the next check. And then because the next check is to check the position of the second object and to see if that's now in range. If it's not in range, then we're going to return to range test out of range, which will clear the carry, which effectively returns that the object is not within range of the object, second object we're testing here. If the position has passed that test, then what we're going to do is we're going to add dh to the position twice because we've got our sprite position and we've got our testing position here and we'd already subtracted once moving it over here. We now need to move to the other extremity. So we're adding twice to move to the other extremity of the range. And we're now going to test again for the player for the second object position. And if it's still out of range, in other words, if it's further over from that axis, then we are again out of range. But if we get to this point here, then the sprite is indeed within range of the second object on the X axis. And now we want to test the Y axis and we're basically doing the exact same thing. Here we were using BH, DH and CH. Here we're using BL, DL and CL. And so this time we're checking the Y axis. So once again, the first thing we're doing here is we are subtracting the height of the range and we're testing again. So this is effectively taking our sprite here and then it's taking our testing position and it's moving us up the screen to here. And so that's what we're doing here. And then once again, we're checking the range to see if we've gone off the screen. Because again, if we're at the very top of the screen and we do a subtraction of our range check, we will go off the top of the screen and end up somewhere at the bottom. And we might collide with an object at the very bottom of the screen, which isn't what we're intending to do here. So if we've gone over range here, we're skipping over this next check. If we haven't though, we're now comparing to the second object and seeing if that object is within this range. If it's not, then it, it may have been within range on the X axis, but it's out of range on the Y axis. So again, we're clearing the carry and returning to tell the code that we aren't in range. If we are in range on that axis though, we now need to test the other way. So again, we, we did our subtraction before, so we're now above and we're now adding twice to move to the bottom of the range and we are then comparing and trying again. And again, if we're out of range, we're going to skip over and clear that carry. But now we've checked all of our ranges. So if the object is within range on all of the axes, if it, we, we now know that it's within the testing range. So we're setting the carry and we're returning and that's what we're doing there. Now, of course, when that carry is set, we're then going to need to do some kind of processing. Now, in this test version of the game, we're just skipping over here. If we're not in range and if we are, we're randomizing the enemy. The final version of the game, though, will only do this check when the player has pressed fire. And when the player presses fire and it's in range, it will kill the, the bat and it will respawn it somewhere else and give us some points and things. So this is just an early test version of the code to show the random number generator and the range checking in action so you can know how they work. So there we go. So that's all we're covering today. Uh, if you've liked what you've seen, you know, please like and subscribe. Please go to the website, download the source code, have a play with it yourself. And as I always say, nothing I'm showing you here is the best code in the world. I'm sure there's millions of far better random number generators out there than this one. But if you want to make use of this in any of your own code in any way, you're welcome to do so. I don't mind. Anyway, hope you've um, found something interesting today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.